Hello everyone and welcome to Fusion IP Talks, a student-led webinar platform for sharing knowledge about nuclear fusion science and engineering. I'm Katerina and I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, who is Javier Artola. He will be speaking about coupling plasma and ball currents for disruption simulation. Uh, Javier has been studying physics at the University of Valencia in Spain where he got interested in fusion research and decided to study physics at Pagomax in a master at Ex Monsanto University in France. And later he started his PhD in the same university where he has got an extensive experience uh, in simulations of MHD plasma instability and disruption in Pagomax. And he has got a PhD research award for his thesis uh, at the Plasma Physics Division of the European Physical Society. And now Javier is a postdoc at ITER organization in the frame of postdoctoral Manaka Fellowship. And he continues his research in this complex and exciting issue of 3D simulations of disruption. And before the talk starts, I would like to remind you that our webinar is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube and also we're live, live streaming on Facebook now. Uh, the talk will last about uh, 25 minutes. So there will be question and answer session at the end of the talk, but if you for some reason have to leave earlier, you can post your question in the chat box and we will read it for you later on and you will be able to watch the answer uh, on YouTube user. And without further delay, I give the floor to Javier. So hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in this, uh, in this meeting. Uh, I want to, to thank Ekaterina for the introduction. So I don't, I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about coupling plasma and wall currents for doing disruption simulations. And I want to, to give special thanks for, to Matthias Holzel and Simon Pinches for their help on this talk. So, uh, before than anything, let's give a, an overview on disruptions. For that, I highly recommend you that you see uh, Ekaterina's uh, talk on disruptions, uh, to see uh, um, disruptions in more detail. Let me, for those of you which are not familiar with disruptions, let me introduce them to you. So disruptions are violent MHZ events that lead to a sudden loss of the plasma energy. Basically, they consist uh, on two phases, which is the, the thermal en energy loss. We call that the thermal quench. And the magnetic en energy loss, which we call the current quench. So in these uh, two plots, you can see an example of a disruption, uh, which will be for ITER. This is uh, what we think would happen in ITER. So in blue, you see the plasma current, and in red, the thermal energy. Uh, the first phase, as I said, is the thermal quench, which in ITER we, we expect it to happen in one, three milliseconds. And right after, you have the current quench, which uh, typically would last around 100 milliseconds. Also, during the current quench, uh, the plasma moves uh, vertically, and we call that a vertical displacement event. Uh, there are many different causes of uh, why disruptions happen. Uh, the, the first uh, causes are if you go beyond the, st the stability limits that we already know. So, for example, the current limit, the plasma current limit, which is basically a limit on the edge safety factor. You need a safety factor bigger, typically bigger than two. A density limit, where your density has to be smaller than the green bulb uh, density and a pressure limit where your normalized beta should be typically smaller than 3.5%. Uh, as well, you get uh, the limits related to runaway electrons, which are typically uh, related to density. If you go to very low density, you, you may have runaway electrons. Uh, but even if you don't violate these limits, disruptions can be triggered by other causes, and the most common cause are log modes. And there are many different uh, ways of triggering uh, log modes that I'm not going to list. Here I'm, I'm giving you these references where you, you can find many of them. And as well, you can get a disruption if you lose the, the vertical control of your plasma. 
So all of these limits are related to typical um, plasma instabilities. The current limit is uh, related to kink modes, the density limit with uh, radiative instabilities, the pressure limit with ballooning and internal modes, and the log modes are typically uh, resistive modes which create magnetic islands which at, at some point they, they collapse and make the, the thermal quench. And the loss of vertical control are the vertical displacement events that I will, I will describe now. So of course, why disruptions are important? Uh, the main cause they are important is because they cause large uh, heat and electromagnetic loads on the walls or the, the structures facing the plasma. So in here you can see a picture of, uh, of the wall of jet, which uh, has been melted after a disruption. Uh, and because of that, I mean, the, the, the walls at ITER will be quite expensive. We need to, to avoid disruptions. If we can, we need to avoid them. But if we cannot, we should mitigate them to avoid this uh, wall damage. Also, we have to point out that uh, there are a lot of disruptions that we cannot control. For example, in JET, at least 10% of the discharges disrupt unintentionally. So even if we don't violate these stability limits, we still get disruption. And this is why uh, we need simulations in order to understand why we trigger disruptions and also to, to predict uh, how big these loads on the wall are going to be. And we, of course, need to optimize uh, the mitigation with the uh, shutter pellet injection and other techniques. Okay, so how do we simulate disruptions? In order to simulate a disruption, the approach that we follow is to solve um, the extended MHD equations uh, for the plasma in 3D toroidal geometry. So we, we get the, this is an example of a compass simulation with the code JOREC, which is the one that I used. Uh, in this simulation, uh, I simulate a vertical displacement event plus uh, an N equals one mode that is unstable. And for that, we just create a mesh in the plasma domain. And in that mesh, we solve the typical MHZ equations. And if you are not familiar with them, they are, uh, simply a conservation of mass, a conservation of a heat, and the conservation of momentum, as well as Faraday's law uh, mixed with a generalized Ohm's law. So we solve, we solve these equations and we can more or less uh, predict disruption. Well, sorry, we cannot predict them yet, but we can learn many things about disruption. So my talk is about wall currents. And the, the question, when, whenever you have a disruption, uh, the disruption makes the plasma to move and that induces currents in your vacuum vessel and your walls. And the question is whether we should include them for doing this disruption. Are, there, are they important? And of course the answer is that they are very important. So whenever you have a disruption, you normally lose uh, the vertical control of the plasma. There are some exceptions in some tokamaks, but normally whenever you have a disruption, you lose the control. And whenever you lose the vertical control, you get a vertical displacement event or VD. So why do we get these vertical displacement events? Um, the main reason is that if you want a plasma with an elongation, nowadays most of, of our tokamaks uh, operate with uh, large elongation, you need these PF coils, here PF coil one and PF coil two, which pull the plasma towards them. So PF coil two generates this force and PF coil one this force. They stretch the plasma. So if the plasma moves a little bit, just a small perturbation in the vertical position, then the plasma gets closer to one coil and then there is an imbalance of forces. So this force now pulls more uh, stronger than this force. Imagine a case without walls. If we have this event without walls, the plasma will move towards, for example, in this case, to PF coil one in a time scale of microseconds. And microseconds we cannot control and will be extremely violent. However, if you put um, a conducting wall in between, 
uh, once the plasma moves, uh, immediately induces currents in the in the wall, which create a force in the opposite direction of the direction that the plasma is moving, and therefore these uh, wall currents slow down the vertical motion. Uh, and actually, instead of being microseconds, once the, the walls can stabilize, um, the motion or the time scale of the motion is given by the resistive decay time of the wall currents, which is given by the wall conductivity. For example, in ITER, these uh, VDEs occur in around 0.5 seconds. And this is thanks to, the, to this very high wall conductivity that ITER has. So uh, the conclusion is that wall currents are super important. You can not put them because otherwise the plasma moves in microseconds and otherwise it moves in 0.5 seconds. So this is six orders of magnitude. So of course you have to include them. And they are, they are also very important for, for 3D stability. This is just 2D stability, but for 3D, it's also very important to include them. Okay, so how do we simulate these wall currents and how do we couple them with the plasma equations? So I'm going to explain you a first method, which is used by the, the Gold M3C1. And in my opinion, this, this method is, is uh, very straightforward and, and it, works, it works very well, but it's computationally expensive. So what you do with this method is to you create a mesh or a grid uh, for which is shared by the plasma wall and vacuum. So even, even the vacuum very far away from the plasma, you create a grid there and you solve uh, Maxwell's equations there. So in the, in the plasma domain that would be here in, in red, in this part of the grid, you, you would solve the extended MHD equations. In the wall, which in this, this case is very thin, is this uh, dense black region. Uh, here, the, the, the blue and, and green lines. You would solve Ohm's law plus Maxwell's equations. And in the vacuum, you just solve the, the Maxwell's equations in the vacuum. And then what you do, uh, for boundary conditions is to say that the magnetic field B is continuous across all of these domains, okay? And also you need a boundary condition for the end of your grid, which in, in this case is the purple line, is the end of the vacuum. And there you typically put ideal uh, boundary conditions or ideal, ideally conducting boundary conditions. Basically you say that at that point you have a, an infinitely, infinitely conductive wall. This first method has some problems. Uh, the first one is how far do you have to mesh the vacuum? Like where do you stop meshing the, va the, the vacuum? How big has to be your, your grid? And whenever you pick up a grid, you need to, to check that you have, uh, that, the big is, that the grid is big enough and then your results are well converged. So can we find a technique in which we don't have to mesh the vacuum and of course the question the answer is yes and this is what i'm going to explain you now so this other technique where you don't have to, to measure the vacuum is based on the virtual casing principle which i'm going to explain this is a very old principle already safranov in 1972 uh, used it for his, his calculations it's a principle that tells you that if you have a point p far away from uh, arbitrary plasma currents here in, in orange, the field produced uh, by these currents in P can be obtained just by surface currents uh, on a surface S which, uh, which engloves or, or is around the, this plasma current. Um, this is something that we can prove very easily. I will show you how to. So imagine this situation. You have, again, this point P, you have an ideal wall uh, in blue, which is now our surface, and inside the surface there are no plasma, no currents, there's nothing, okay? So at T, T equals zero, there are no currents and no fields. No currents and no magnetic fields. That's trivial. Now what happens if at T bigger than zero, suddenly we create plasma currents inside the this domain? Now, because of the properties of the uh, ideally conducting wall, 
this ideal world where will screen out these internal currents uh, such that the field at this point P is still zero because this is what ideal worlds uh, do. They just screen out everything and they do that by generating surface currents. So you will have these currents created in, in S that will make uh, the field at P to be still zero. Now, because the field at P is the sum of the field produced by the plasma, BP, and the field produced by, the, by these uh, wall currents, then, because it has to be zero, you find that this uh, very thin surface, or this, this, uh, this ideal wall surface, can create exactly the same field as this complicated plasma that can be 3D volumetric as you want. So the important part of this is that <coughs> we can use this property for numerical advantages because now we can compute plasma fields with 2D integrals instead of 3D integrals. That by using the typical uh, BO Tansavart law for the magnetic field. For example, if you want to compute the magnetic field at P, the, the magnetic vector potential at P, you just need to to integrate over a surface, over this closed surface DS, instead of integrating in all of this volume, which is much more expensive. So this is a very, very good for, for efficiency. And now, how can we use this property in order to not uh, mesh the vacuum? Okay, so what you can do is at this surface S, you can find the, this equivalent surface current that will represent your complicated plasma by inverting this, uh, this system. So you will calculate the, the normal magnetic field to the surface, n is the normal vector, by using a, a biotan savart law. And if you can invert uh, this, uh, this equation, then you can find your, your surface current. You, you will go through all the points of your surface, and at the end you have the same uh, the same number of unknowns, and you can calculate these uh, these current densities for the surface current. Now, once you have the surface currents, you can use them to compute the the component of the field that is tangential to the surface S. So you just do the cross product instead of the dot product, you do this cross product with n. And uh, you get, as a function of, of the surface currents, uh, you, you get the field. And now you can use that you have inverted the system to write down the tangential component of the field as a function of the normal uh, component of the field, which typically would look like a double integral on the on this surface. So this is the boundary condition that we need to put at S in order to include all the vacuum. So if at this S surface we put this boundary condition, we automatically take into account the full vacuum and we don't have to mesh it. Just the problem is that we have to do a double integral, but this is much more efficient than, than doing uh, all the vacuum. And as I said, basically this boundary condition is a relation between the normal component of the field and the tangential component of the field at S, this surface. When you solve this, this um, boundary condition numerically, it looks like a, like a matrix form. At the end, the tangential field is a matrix multiplying uh, all the normal components of a magnetic field on the surface. Okay, but what about the wall currents? I haven't talked about, uh, about that yet. Now I'm going to explain you this, this method which, which we use in in the code Jorex Starwood, which is the one that we use. And what we do there is we put our surface S, so the surface where we apply the boundary condition for the plasma equation in between the plasma and the resistive wall. Okay. And at S, we use the same boundary condition. The tangential field is related to the normal field uh, through a matrix. And this matrix, we call it the, the vacuum response matrix. Now, uh, for this boundary condition to work, it's just the magnetic field produced by the plasma. Okay, so this uh, P here means the magnetic field produced by the plasma. Now we can take this equation 
and express it as a function of the total field because the, uh, the field produced by the plasma is the total one minus the field produced by the wall, this resistive wall in two. And the same for the normal field, the norm, total normal field minus the contribution of the wall. Now uh, you can regroup this and this term into this term. So because the normal field and the tangential field you can express as a function of the currents flowing on the resistive wall. So finally, the boundary condition looks like this. Tangential field is related to the, norm, the total normal field and it has a contribution from the wall currents. But of course, we didn't solve the problem of how, uh, how the wall currents evolve. So the way uh, we do this, of course, we have to solve an equation for the, for the evolution of the wall currents. And this equation, you may, you may find it familiar. They are just RL circuit equations. So what you normally do is you take your wall. This is a simple uh, 2D wall uh, uh, discretized in the, the ether vacuum vessel. You divide it into, into triangles. And for each triangle or, or each element of your wall, you have an equation, this R, 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 RL uh, circuit equation, where you find here in L, the self-inductance, uh, the time derivative of the wall currents. This M is the, the mutual inductance between the plasma and the wall. And now this is the tricky part. Um, in order to couple the plasma and the wall, you use these surface currents that we have found before. I, I remind that the surface currents that will represent the full plasma volume can be found just by using the normal magnetic field at the surface S. Okay. And uh, of course, you get the term relating the wall's resistance. And if you want, as well, you can add an external voltage to drive uh, currents in the wall. But typically, this does not exist in experiments. Okay. So now I'm going to show you some uh, applications of using this technique. Uh, of course, the first one is to try to understand experiments. So what I have done with Ekaterina is to try to validate um, my simulations with the compass experiments. These are simulations of um, with the code Jorik Star Wall. And here, what you can see is the vertical position of the plasma center as a function of time, Z, the, or the position of the magnetic axis in Jorik, so in the simulation in blue, and in the in red in the in the experiment, so we are we are we try to match the experimental results, and here you can see the plasma current in experiment in red and in blue in the code. Here you have to look at the the dashed line, but unfortunately the agreement is not perfect. So here what you see is a vertical displacement event. The plasma has gone from being centered into the lower diverter. And here you can see the temperature in kilo electron volts. And the, the black arrows are the, the currents that are induced on the vacuum vessel during this disruption. And you can see how they have a very complicated 3D pattern. Here you can see some eddies and how the, the currents deviate as, as they move uh, toward them. Another very important application is to calculate wall forces. Wall forces are very important because the disruptions can create a very large forces on the vacuum vessel. And we need to understand these forces and there is no, we really don't understand them. So these simulations will hopefully help in the understanding of this force. So here you are seeing an, a simulation of the NSTX tokamak. Uh, again, in gray, you see the vacuum vessel with with the arrows are the, the currents flowing on the vessel. And here you can see the plasma. Now is the toroidal current density in megaamperes per meter uh, in, in some time of the disruption. And in here you can see um, the time evolution. So this is time. You can see the plasma current that doesn't change too much. And you see the thermal energy in kilojoules. So at this point, uh, the plasma um, be the, the, the magnetic field line becomes chaotic and then you lose the thermal energy very fast. So this is the thermal quench that in NSTX is much faster than in ITER 
which is around 0 0.2 milliseconds, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 milliseconds. And in here, this is the total wall force computed from the, from the simulations. So this is the total uh, horizontal force. So it's a force that would try to move the, the, the full vacuum vessel horizontally. And normally this is an, an, a purely n equals one component. This is an example of how the, um, these simulations can be used to, to analyze the, the topology of the magnetic field during disruptions, which is very complicated. Uh, these are Poincaré plots. I don't know whether you are familiar with them, but they show that at the beginning uh, of the disruption, we have a, a big fraction of uh, uh, closed flux surfaces and at the edge, we are already getting some stochasticity. And as the time passes, the, this stochasticity gets inside the plasma, and at the end, you don't get a closed flux surface anymore, and then you lose all your uh, heat through the, through, the magnetic, or through the open magnetic field lines. These uh, empty regions that you see here, they are empty because in there, the field lines go directly to the wall. So you, you lose the heat very fast. Okay, ah, yes, sorry, I forgot to show you uh, a video for this simulation, just for, uh, for fun. Or, where is it? Here. So here you see how the, the full simulation, the plasma moves uh, downwards. This is the vertical displacement event. And as it moves downwards, it induces these currents in the vacuum vessel which try to stop the plasma from moving. At some point, the equilibrium properties of the plasma change and the plasma becomes unstable, in this case, to kink modes. And these kink modes make, make the plasma to become uh, stochastic. And at this point, uh, you get a very stochastic plasma and you lose all the energy. The, sorry, the thermal energy. After, uh, after that, there is the current quench phase where you lose all the current and the magnetic energy and you end up with very large wall currents. So at the end you get large wall currents, but they are mostly to be at the end. Okay, let's go to the summary of the talk. why I cannot share it. That's a problem. Ah, no, sorry. Um, ah, sorry. Okay, the summary. So the, the ideas I would like uh, for uh, to you to, to retain from this talk is that uh, disruptions are very important for the Tokamak community right now and we need to do simulations uh, to understand them and predict uh, the loads for the world and we need to predict understand and also to optimize the mitigation techniques for the world loads also as you can see it's super important to include wall currents in the simulations because they really determine how the plasma moves in disruptions. And I have explained the two methods to, to include the, the vacuum as well as the wall currents in your simulations. The first one, the first method is meshing uh, the plasma plus the wall plus the vacuum and then you just solve the full system. And the second method is, is just to solve for the equations uh, of the wall, the circuit equations of the wall and then you use this boundary condition, which takes into account the full vacuum, this one that we obtain finally. And you can do that thanks to the nice uh, virtual casing principle that uh, was uh, done by, by Safranov at the beginning of the, of the history of fusion almost. So that's it. Um, yeah, I think uh, I finished. And thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk and detailed, clear explanation of such a challenging topic. Uh, now the floor is uh, open for questions. Uh, all the participants will be promoted to panelists now, 
and uh, you should be able to reach a question and answer session the section uh, on zoom and please uh, use a uh, hand raise uh, option so that i will be able to unmute you and in case you have any issues with your microphone uh, or raising hand feature uh, you can also use chat box as a backup option uh, let's see if we have any questions so far people are still becoming panelists and getting familiar with the interface i guess okay, should i stop sharing my screen or uh you can leave it for now because probably you will need your slides right. uh to ask uh to to answer some questions yes Uh, and in the meanwhile, while, while we're waiting, I would like to remind you that the recording of this talk will be available on YouTube soon. You can find the links uh, in the chat box. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to ask you to take a few minutes and fill out uh, a survey uh, and uh, give us some feedback how we could uh, improve our webinar platform. You can also subscribe for uh, our email uh, news newsletter and we will send you information about next uh, talks by email. Okay, I see there is a question from uh, Faria. Maybe I can unmute you. Uh, Paria, you can go ahead with your question. Can you hear us? Okay, maybe I will read it out then. So uh, the question is, uh, I was wondering if you can explain more about the code that you used. Ah, uh, yes, of course. So, yeah, I can... The code that we use is called Jorik. It's a code that was initially, that solves, a, uh, as I said, this, these equations in, in, in 3D triangular geometry. So Jorik, what it does is, um, is use a finite element method to solve these equations. So for that, um, these, these elements that we are here, they are Bezier patches. So in the in the poloidal plane and for the toroidal direction we use Fourier harmonics so this is how we discretize space and then for the time discretization we use a uh, in, uh, implicit time stepping uh, in order to be able to, to simulate bigger time steps of course this is computationally more expensive but uh, at the end you, you win because you can simulate larger time scale um, what else about Jorik? Jorik was initially used for simulating elms, but now um, we we are simulating uh, disruptions and also doing uh, shutter pellets injection with Jorik, and even we are doing runaway runaway electron simulations coupled to, to the MHC equation. So there are many things going on now in Jorik. Yeah, I can send you the reference for for I should have put a reference in Jorik here. Sorry. Uh, if there are any links uh, that you think are useful, uh, any references to some articles uh, you would like to share with the participants, uh, please send it to us uh, and uh, we will post them on Facebook next uh, to your talk and uh, uh, on YouTube with uh, your recording too. Yes, okay. Okay, I see another one uh, from Moritz uh, Linkman. Uh, please go ahead. Um, yes, um, thank you for this um, very clear talk. Um, I had a question that it concerns the possibilities to control um, <clears throat> um, these events that you're describing. So you've described um, very well with the Poincaré diagrams uh, how the wall currents become chaotic. Um, 
So I was just wondering, I have a background in nonlinear dynamics, but not in, uh, uh, in nuclear fusion. Is there a way of potentially um, controlling uh, the chaos that is occurring in these wall currents, say through, um, through a feedback process or something like this? Oh, okay, so, so sorry first, um, the Poincaré plots that you've seen Mm -hmm. are not for the wall currents. This is the, this is the plasma itself. So this okay. is the plasma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, there are, there are, for, for some of the instabilities that may cause disruptions, such as the, what we call the resistive wall modes, they are, there, they, there are these techniques to do feedback control on these modes mm -hmm. in order to keep them stable. And also other types of, of modes like uh, neoclassical tearing modes. Uh, many of the things that can cause disruptions there in, for example, in ITER, they will do feedback control for this type of instability. But um, even if we do feedback for these instabilities, we they do it also in JET and in other tokamaks, uh, is somehow we still have disruptions. We still have them. So we don't have the knowledge yet to control these instabilities, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, once, once the disruption happens and you have a big portion of the plasma that becomes stochastic, uh, then, then you cannot do anything, I think. You can do it before this happens. But also this, the, the feed lines, you look, look at these plots, the, the feed line becomes chaotic in 0 0.1 milliseconds, it's extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can do anything with these very fast events. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer more or less the question? Yes, yes. Thanks. Anybody else wanting to ask Javier? There's a question from Andres in the chat. Oh, thank you. Uh, are there techniques for real time uh, VD estimation? VDE estimation. Yeah, I guess he has to specify a bit more what is, what does he mean by VDE estimation? Uh, if you, we Andres, are. Could you clarify your question a little bit? Uh, yeah. Hi. Great type talk, by the way. But uh, I was wondering if there are some techniques for. Um, um, a measuring displacement in the um, in the plasma column in real time. Oh yes, yes, we do it all the time. Actually, all tokamaks, all tokamaks have these vertical control systems, which basically first they detect how much the plasma uh, has moved from a from a location that is determined, predetermined, and then they automatically correct uh, the currents in the PF coils. To correct the plasma position, otherwise you would always you would never have a stable plasma. You always need this vertical control system working on real time. Otherwise, all the time the plasma will go to the wall. There is no tokamak with elongation that does not have this system. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions to Javier? Uh, maybe I will ask in the meanwhile. Uh, sorry if I missed it. Um, are you able to take into account uh, plasma current asymmetries in your code? And also, uh, can you see uh, symmetrical events such as uh, halo asymmetrical halo currents? Yes, yes. Um, the, these equations that we solve uh, are in 3D. So all the 3D asymmetries that can arise, they arise. For example, uh, this simulation of this VD, it, it, it includes n equals one component. So it means that every toroidal plane is different. So this plasma is already asymmetric. But it's curious that with the JORIC code, uh, what I've seen is something that we measure in the experiments, the, the asymmetry of the total plasma current, the IP, the symmetry of IP, I cannot find it at all in Yorick, but 
I've seen in codes of NCDC1 and Nimrod, they see asymmetries, very small ones, around 3% or maximum of a 3%. And actually, we are writing a paper trying to understand why on, on, on this. But uh, yes, for example, um, this application that I show you at the end, you see all how, how the wall currents are. These are eddy currents on the wall. So you see how really they are on 3D. They are really not 3D. Mm -hmm. So the code is able to do that. And thanks to that, you can calculate the total force in the wall, which it, if the plasma was 2D, the horizontal force would be zero because there wouldn't be any preferential direction. But in 3D, it can be. So yes, but we have, I have to say that still we haven't been able to simulate these enormous wall forces that we see at Jet. So we are not ready. We still have very simple models. Like uh, we, we have never done VDEs, including radiation and including uh, SPI and all of that. Uh, this is kind of new, like doing this type of uh, 3D simulations with VDEs is kind of, is kind of new now. So we are starting to, to do it even in Europe and in, also in the US. Okay, thank you very much. And I see another question, question from Alfredo. Yeah. Go yes, ahead. can I ask a question? Hello, hi, Alfredo Portone speaking. Uh, uh, Javier, do you have uh, already some estimate uh, for ether? Hollow currents, uh, BDs, uh, asymmetric forces, rotating forces, and such like. Uh, no, not, not, not yet. To be honest, not yet. I've been spending a lot of time trying to, to do validation in Compass. Uh, and I, I don't have uh, estimates for the forces in, in ITER. I have estimate. I, I, have, I have done scans for halo currents, for how big are the halo currents in ITER in 2D. In 2D, I, I have a lot of scans. And as people more or less already know, uh, what determines the fraction of halo currents that you will have is the ratio between uh, the current quench time and the wall time. So in ITER, if you, if you manage to do the disrupt the, the current quench in about 100 uh, milliseconds, typically the, the total amount of halo fractions, of halo currents that you have, would be around 10 to 20 percent. Which, uh, how do you get to this uh, estimate? So what I, what I did is to use this, simul, uh, to use this code and uh, do scans on the halo width and on the halo temperature. Mm. And then I did many different possibilities and, and you see that for the reasonable ones, you get uh, around 10%, 20%. Of currents in the scrape of layer, and by doing that, uh, Javier, by doing that, you solve the equation of the fusion of current in the structure. Yes, we solve uh, our structure is resistive, so we uh, maybe I have it here. So this is the equation for the wall current. So you, you get the, res the resistive decay in, in the in the wall, and you have also the resistive decay in the plasma, which for us is both. Uh, core and halo. For, we don't make a distinction between open and closed feed lines. So, so we have both. Uh, so we we solve the resistive diffusion in, in both wall and, and plasma. Okay, that's good. Okay, and do you have published work on this? Uh, yes, we have. We have um, published this. Uh, we have published a paper. This one with Isabel Krebs. Uh, 2020, where we compare the Golden Twist One, Jorik, and, and Nimrod. And for this type of VD simulations, we we calculate the halo currents and all of that. But this scans for ITER, I, I didn't publish them yet. I think it would be very useful for the community. As you know, there are efforts around the world, uh, also with M3D and uh, Karma and other codes that uh, to couple the, the wall currents to the equilibrium current, I mean, to the equilibrium plasma. Yes, 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 I'm, I'm aware of all of that. At the end, we are planning to do a coupling with uh, Jorek and Karibi. I know them okay. to one, they are doing a coupling as well, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not full implicit. So we are thinking on 
we are investigating now how to do a full implicit coupling with uh, Jorek and, and Kariti. Okay, very good. Anybody else? I don't see any raised hands here. Well, anyway, if... Uh, if you know what, can I ask? Yeah, sure. Please go on. Hey, Bill. Thanks for your nice presentation. I'm Niras from Exmas University. Hi, Niras. How are you? Hello. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> we'll talk later. In one of your uh, slide number 10, uh, you mentioned about uh, the beta limit to for this, yes. Uh, so I was just wondering this beta limit that is 3.5%, is it uh, for ITER or it uh, varies uh, from device to device? It varies from device to device. Actually for spherical tokamaks, it is higher. But for typical aspect ratios of 0 0.3, uh, normally it's this limit. But it also depends on the on the internal inductance of the plasma. So uh, it's not, a, it's not, this is just a, an indication. It's not a, a hard limit, let's say. Ah, okay, okay. So it's not a, like a four eater or something. It just depends on which uh, device you are simulating. It depends on the device. It also depends uh, on the prof on, of the type of the scenario you are simulating. So if you're, if you have very flat current profile, then beta N will change a little bit. If you have a, a more peaked current profile, then it will, it will be different. It really depends on the, detail, the, the, the details of the profile. This is a global quantity, so the total integral of the, of the plasma pressure. So you miss a lot of information by doing that. No, it's, it's, it's a too hard simplification, but it already tells you some, some order of magnitude. Uh, okay, okay, no problem. I was just wondering. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else? Well, you will have an opportunity to post your question on YouTube or on Facebook later on if you will have more questions. And uh, I would like to thank uh, you again for joining and thank you, Javier, for the really interesting talk. Thanks to you for inviting. And uh, this is the end of the official part of our webinar. Now the recording uh, will be stopped and live streaming will be stopped on Facebook. Uh, but I will leave a Zoom uh, webinar open so that you can stay and uh, have uh, informal chat uh, should you wish to do so. Feel free to unmute yourself and let me know if you have troubles with it and talk about anything you would like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.